I want to give you a, li a little bit of my background. Now, before I was with Southern Michigan Bank and Trust, I just joined here uh, within the last couple of months. Uh, I was with Fidelity Investments. And with Fidelity Investments, I had a 12 state territory that I covered. They sent me to, to help folks all across those 12 states and they could really come see me about any financial planning goal that they had. Alan, I need help with the foundation. Help me put together a budget. Help me knock out this debt. Maybe we're getting more advanced. Common question that may come up is, hey, if I keep doing what I'm doing, when can I retire? Then you had the folks that were retiring. Now it's, hey, how much can I pay myself and not run out of money? The income planning side of things. For Fidelity, I ran my own practice. And so it's since 2004, so call it a little over a decade and a half that I've been helping folks well, with their financial planning and their financial planning goals. You can see a little bit of alphabet soup after my name there down at the bottom. Really all that stands for is certified financial professional and a chartered retirement planning counselor. So a little over a decade and a half, I've been helping folks uh, with a number of different goals, not just specific to retirement, but that's really where we're going to focus our time over the course of our workshop here. I'm going to touch on a few things, but just to give you a glimpse of our agenda. Alan, what do I need? How much is enough? What is my number? If I keep doing what I'm doing, when can I retire? That's a common question that comes up often. And I've noticed clients in the past, they'll go out and, and uh, maybe they even have a Google search. And then a couple hours later, they're still in the same boat. And it's confusing. It's hard to individualize. And a lot of times you get that political answer. It's, oh, it's different for everyone. Well, that was helpful. What is my number? How do I individual my plans? That's what I hope that we can gather from our first section here on what you may need to retire comfortably. And then we're going to jump into strategies to save more. Hey, Alan, I'm playing this game of catch up. What is the most tax efficient way that I can approach this retirement goal? So we're going to spend quite a bit of time in that particular section, and then we're going to finish with the investing part. And I really want to change the wording on that. It's not necessarily how do I preserve. For a lot of folks, it's I have to get there. How do I grow my savings? And then what are some strategies for investing during my career, whether it's mid-career, tail end, or I'm starting to pay myself on a monthly basis? So that's where we're going to spend uh, the majority of our time, and then we're going to save a good portion at the end as well to make sure that I address the questions that you may have. But I'll take little pauses as we go through to, to check in and make sure that folks are, are still cozy and warm. But I want to start with the most popular question first. How much do I need? What's my number? And here's what I'm going to ask you to do, because you may have targets. Or you may see some benchmarks that people throw. When I say people, I mean advisors and, and some of the research that you folks may have already done. Here's what I want to do. I want to tackle some of those. If you go back far enough, it used to be everybody needs a million dollars to retire. What I want you to do is visually picture that, crinkle it up, throw it away. And now they're getting into this income replacement. If I make $100,000 a year, I better be able to pay myself $75,000 a year to continue the same lifestyle. Same instance. Visualize it, crinkle it up, throw it away. And even when you see benchmarks or targets like this, the 10 times rule, if you make $50,000 a year, you better be able to pay yourself, or excuse me, you better have saved at least 50000 after your first year, or in your 30s, excuse me. You should have three times your salary in your 40s. You should have six times your salary in your 50s. You reach close to retirement age. Now we're getting to the point where 
you need 10 times your salary by the time you're in your mid to late 60s. But here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Throw this away as well. And I'll get to a demo portion of our of our talk today and show a couple of resources that you may have. But really, it can become a little bit of a goofy math problem. I'm looking at my current expenses. What's in my budget now? That's not going to be in my budget then. Maybe I'll have my mortgage paid off. Maybe I have knocked out this debt or I'm no longer paying on this automobile. There are items in your budget. There are expenses that you have now. That won't be there. In retirement. So if I look at where my money is going now and I scratch out all of the items that are going away, I may have a general idea of what I need on a monthly basis to continue the same lifestyle. But there are a few things that we have to add in. What makes retirement difficult? And the truth is, you put 10 individuals in front of me. Only two out of 10 are on track to retire at a reasonable age. What makes retirement so difficult? And it really boils down to these five factors here. What are the five key factors? What are the five big risks when it comes to factoring in our retirement? And I'll hit each of these individually, but we can't go through the session without talking about health care, one of the largest expenses that we may see in our retirement. And then we have longevity. I need to make sure I plan for the proper length of retirement so I don't run out of money. And then I'm not so special that everything stays the same price. So I'm dealing with inflation. And I'll dive in a little bit more on a, on a particular client that comes to mind every, every time we talk about the cost of goods continuing to rise. When I retire, I don't hit a wall and stop investing. I still need growth. And when we're talking about that, we get a little bit into the investing side of things, but I have to outpace that inflation. I'm no longer saving. I have to create my own income stream, so I still need exposure to the market. But one of the biggest risks to any household retirement is us. How much am I going to be withdrawing from my retirement savings? And what percentages should I expect or what is the, the key amount that I'm dipping into on an annual basis? And how do I split that up monthly or quarterly? How creative do we get there? But one of the biggest risks is our own discipline on how much that we are withdrawing. So let's take a step back. I'll hit each of these individually, and then I'm going to pause and make sure everybody's cozy and warm because these are important to be comfortable with. But let's start with health care. You put the average couple in front of me. They're in their mid-60s. They're in average health. They are going to spend, and they're retiring today, by the way, they are going to spend close to $300,000 on health care. And that's a pre-tax number. Why is that important? Well, a lot of folks retiring today, when they get a $1,000 medical bill, they're taking $1,200, $1,300 out of their 401ks, out of their IRAs to cover that expense. If we want to save money on health care, we utilize health savings accounts, we utilize Roth IRAs, what are some funds or what are some investment type accounts where the IRS doesn't get the dip into that, we just get it completely tax free. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the middle section. But then we have longevity, longer lifespans. The average couple in their mid 60s, there is a 50% chance one of those individuals is going to live to their mid-80s. 
there's a 25% chance one of those individuals is going to live to their late 90s. One of the last things we want to do is underestimate the length of our retirement. So I always have a client that comes to mind when I talk about longevity. And they came to me and they said, Alan, we need you to do an income plan. How much can I pay myself and not run out of money? And I presented this income plan and it showed that they were going to live to their early 90s. I'd rather you plan for a long retirement than be wrong than have you run out of money. And the whole time the husband's looking across at me and he's scratching his head and I said, OK, let's talk about this. He said, Alan, there's no way. We are living to our early 90s. And I said, fine, sometimes I have a dark sense of humor. I use sarcasm to prove points. It's something I learned from my father years ago, but. I'll say, OK, what's the latest? That you think that your retirement's going to last? Alan, there's no way that we're going to live past our mid 80s. Well, let's fast forward time. You're 65 now. Let's go 20 years into the future. You're sitting across from your lovely wife and you're having breakfast. You're both in your mid 80s. What's that conversation going to look like? Maybe it's awkward and it looks like this. Hey, one of us has to go. We talked to that dork from Southern Michigan Bank and Trust and he said he was going to plan for us to live to our mid 80s and now we're both out living that plan. All jokes aside, we don't want to underestimate how long that lifespan may be. So we get a little conservative there. And then we have inflation. Historical inflation increasing, cost of goods are increasing three, three and a half percent. Last 10, 15 years, two, two and a half percent. Good rule of thumb. If you go through that goofy math problem, you say, hey, maybe I need $3,000 a month to retire. And you're retiring in 25 years. Well, I need 6,000 a month. Every 25 years, inflation doubles. But I had a client that I would talk to about this, and he was just a life insurance client, but he would always uh, bury money in his backyard. And I would say, Don, 10 years from now, you're going to go dig that money up, and it's going to count the exact same of what you buried, but it's not going to spend the same. So don't let inflation sneak up on you there and then we have long-term planning we don't hit a wall and stop investing we still need that growth we're no longer saving now we're pulling money out to pay our own income stream most clients that get to retirement age they have half their money in something more conservative they have the other half exposed to the market they're going to get a little bit more growth but the important part is, is we're not all just sitting in cash because the previous concern was inflation. We have to make sure our purchasing power is remaining strong. And then day to day expenses. How much am I withdrawing? Out of my account. And a good rule of thumb is between four and five percent. So if I have a million dollars, I'm only taking out 40,000 or 50,000 in that first year. And that gets me into two, two and a half, three decades worth of income. And once we reach a certain age, if it's a pre-tax account, the IRS is telling us how much we're taking out of our accounts. There's something known as a required distribution. Maybe the IRS gets a little impatient. The age is now 72 and they say, here's how much you need to take out. If you don't, we're going to penalize you. So we go through that goofy math problem. OK, my mortgage is gone. I'm done with this debt. Maybe I was helping my kids with college costs. and That's going to be going away. We arrive at that bottom number. And then we add in these five factors here. So let me stop sharing my screen. All right, perfect. So let me share a couple of resources here. The first one I'm going to share. Is a direct link. And I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse. Of that budget. Now, you talked about that goofy math problem, but where do I go to start putting that budget together? Well, truth of the matter is. One out of four folks have a budget while they're working. 
I don't know how many times I've said over the course of my career, we need to know where our income is going. If three out of four individuals don't have a budget in place, are they getting to the end of the month and wondering where all of their income went? If we want any chance to accomplish any goal, retirement, fill in the blank, we need to have that budget in place and that way we can tackle multiple things at once. So I'll share that with you here in just a brief moment. And the other one that I want to share is once we go through that goofy math problem, what's in my budget now? What's going away? Then we know how much of our income that we need to replace. And the tool that I just put into the, the chat feature there, if you want to copy and paste some of those to a, a Word document or an email to yourself, that's going to tell you what you should be saving. And the truth of the matter is it is different for every individual. But if we want to make the, the muddy water a little bit more clear, just walk through those first two steps. So let me show you what that may look like. So if you go to that link that I put in the chat there and, and you scroll down and you say, OK, how much do I get paid on a monthly basis? And let's just throw numbers out there. And I have a certain amount that that goes to to Uncle Sam. So maybe I put in a figure there and then a certain amount that goes to the state of Michigan. Maybe I'm not paying any city taxes. What that's going to arrive at is what is your monthly take home pay? And then you start filling in some of the blanks. And you say, OK, what's my house payment and just principal and interest? If we have our homes paid off, great, we're in great shape, but we still have property taxes, we still have homeowners insurance. But this is a good one to say, OK, if I'm going to have my mortgage paid off, I don't need to replace that income because I'm not living on it now. Or I have that car paid off or I got those credit card payments knocked out or I have those other debts. And then I'm going to have other essential expenses, even though I'm retired, I still have to keep the lights on. I still have a water and a sewer bill, cable, telephone, Internet. I still have to put food on the table. But the point is, is once you get to the bottom of this, it's going to tell you how much income that you may actually need. Hang on to that number. Once you take out the things that are going away, then we can add in the things that are coming in. OK, let's add in that health care cost. Let's add in the fact that maybe we're going to have some more travel or we're going to have more hobbies. And in the past, I've put calendars in front of, front of clients and say, hey, show me what you're going to do with your time. What day of the week do you spend the most money? Alan, it's a weekend. It's on Saturday usually. Well, guess what? In retirement, every day is that day. So let's not lie to ourselves. Let's say I need to replace X amount, but we put a little bit of a cushion. And then I go out to this re retirement planning calculator. And I could say, hey, I'm in. This is my current age. This is my goal retirement age. This is our household income. I took the steps that that dork from Southern Michigan told me to take, and I need to replace 75% of my income. I don't want to outlive my savings, so I'll be a conservative and say I have a, a reasonable time frame that I get to enjoy my retirement. And with what I'm doing, am I saving enough? Well, right up here, it yells at me. You may need to save a little bit more. Right now, you're saving 8% of your income. Well, what if you were saving 10? Oh my goodness, I am on track to retire at the age that I want and have the retirement that I envision. So some of these calculators are going to take the guesswork out. But the work you need to do on your end is you need to know that monthly amount. That's the most important information for you to have. And you have folks like myself that can help you identify what those numbers may be. You do have younger professionals that say, Alan, there are a lot of moving parts. We're going to be buying a house. We're going to be starting a family. We're trying to knock out this student loan debt. We're all juggling multiple goals, no matter where we're at in our career. That makes it a little more difficult. Then maybe we use some of those benchmarks.
But the important part is we know what we are on track for. And when do I know, want to know if I'm behind? Well, I want to know today. Because time is one of the biggest impacts when it comes to retirement savings. For someone in their mid-30s, maybe it's only a 1% or 2% difference. But the important part is you know that now instead of having to make adjustments later on in our careers. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Moral of the story, know what you need on a monthly basis. If you come to someone like myself and you say, Alan, uh, my number is $5,000 a month, and that's after tax. And we have Social Security coming in, and it's going to be about $3,000 a month after tax. How much do I need to have to pay myself $2,000 a month? Well, maybe it's $2,500 before tax. There's $30,000 a year. Your number is $750,000. It's not a million like everybody else is pushing on us. It's not you need to replace 75%. Maybe that's way too high. So doing some of that initial work on the front end is going to help you identify your specific number. But if everybody was experts at this, I wouldn't be able to feed my family. So it's OK if you lean on uh, an advisor or a, or a resource to help you identify some of those things. All right, let's jump into the next section here. I'm going to share my screen. We're going to talk about that game of catch up. Alan, you said two out of 10 folks are on track. That means eight out of 10 folks are not. And so if I'm playing that game of catch up, what's the most tax efficient way for me to accomplish this retirement goal? And I want to kind of go through that progression. So, all right, how can I save more for the future? Here's our progression. What do we have available to us through our employer? Are we getting a match? We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other benefits for our workplace savings plans. And then we have IRAs. I'm already maximizing what I'm doing inside of my 401k. Or I'm already getting that match. What's the next logical step? We have health savings accounts. The common theme on these first three is the IRS is telling us how much we can put. There are limits to put in to each of these types of accounts. If you're maximizing this, these first three, you're doing really well. But if we get to a point where, hey, we're at the tail end of our career, we just paid off our mortgage, maybe the kids are off the payroll, whatever the case may be, as our income increase, increases or our expenses go down, we should be saving more. So we start with the 401k. And the beauty of the 401k is we pay ourselves first. Think of it was in reverse. Every month you had to call your employer at the end of the month and tell them how much you wanted to save. The convenience factor of having factor of having it come out of our paychecks before it hits our checking account. Because once it hits our checking account, it's like magic. It's gone. Oh, I have this rainy day fund. Call me at the end of the month. I'll invest whatever in that. Well, apparently it rains every day. Paying ourselves first is one of the most convenient and one of the highest success rates. So I get to put those contributions in pre-tax. Nine out of 10 folks, when they retire, they're in a lower tax bracket. That's great. That means I get to shelter all of this from the IRS, pay myself in retirement, and pay less taxes then. But I have an immediate return if I have a match. Let's say if I do 4%, my employer does 4%. That's an immediate 100% return. That makes sense every day of the week. Take all the free money that we can get. This one I struggle with because they mention that you should consider contributing 15% of your income. If I'm doing 11% and my employer's chipping in 4%, I'm at that 15. But for some folks, that may be too much. Alan, I did your first two steps and 
that's well above what I actually need. Well, I, to this date, I've never had a client say, this is ridiculous, Alan, I have too much money. But we also have a lifestyle that we want to live now. So the good news is it doesn't all have to come from you. Your employers can chip in. And some people, if they start early enough, it may be less. Some folks that arrive late to the party or life happened, they cash out an old plan. It may be more. So when you're playing with that calculator, what do I need to save? The example that I gave you, if you were doing 8%, you weren't there. If you were doing 10, you were. So it's not a blanket approach. But if we're looking at some of the younger professionals and there are going to be changes to Social Security, there's going to be changes to Medicare. Maybe it is that high. But don't get discouraged because I know that's a high number. I have three kids. My oldest boy plays travel baseball and travel hockey. So there's a second mortgage. Uh, my youngest, or excuse me, my middle, uh, three sports. And I'll trust him and his older brother to watch their one year old sister in another 10 or 15 years. So I still have childcare. Yes, 15% to me is a high number as well. You don't have to rip the band aid. I even mentioned it before, as our income goes up or our expenses go down, we save more. But the IRS has a say, how much can we put into our 401ks? Well, if I'm under the age of 50, that's 19,500. It has nothing to do with my employer's match. This is all my money. If I'm over the age of 50, I turn 50 December 31st, 2021. I can save an additional 6,500 throughout the entire year which get us, gets us to a pretty considerable amount. So if we're playing that game of catch up, we have quite a bit of wiggle room inside of our 401ks. We also have some flexibility with individual retirement accounts. Maybe you're in a position where you can shelter more income from taxes. IRS limits 6,000 per individual per year is the most that we can save. Could throw an additional thousand if we are over the age of 50. So if I'm over 50, I could save 7,000, but I could also have my spouse open up an account and maybe there's 14,000 that we can avoid paying taxes on now. I can tell you if you're maximizing the 401k and an IRA, it's a considerable savings amount and kudos to you. Most folks, once they get to the tail end of their career, if they're playing that game of catch up, they may have to consider other things besides maximizing these first two. But I want to spend a little time on the choices that we have. And you may even have this choice inside your workplace plan through your employer. But you have a choice on when do you want to pay the taxes? So I mentioned before, nine out of 10 individuals when they retire, they're paying themselves less than what they made when they were working. So 90% are in a lower tax bracket. That means reducing their taxable income now or a traditional IRA makes the most sense. But some folks may not be comfortable assuming that taxes are never gonna increase. And Alan, I wanna put a dent in that number that you mentioned for healthcare, well, Roth, is one of the best ways to accomplish that. I pay the taxes now. Hey, I'm getting paid every other week. When I retire, they're not gonna keep sending me that paycheck. So I'll pay the taxes now because I can afford to. And when I retire, everything that I put in, everything that I earned is tax free. So let's put numbers to that. Let's say over the course of my career, I save $50,000 into a Roth IRA. And once it's been open for five years and I'm over 59 and a half, there's always a catch. But let's say over a course of a few decades that 50,000 grew to over 200,000. Guess what? All 200,000 is tax free. Maybe that's what I use to cover those healthcare costs so I could pay dollar for dollar instead of having to pull it from my taxable account. So we have a choice on the IRA side. You may have a choice inside your 401k. There is no perfect formula. Taxes could change. Tax laws could change on a Roth IRA. Don't pull your hair out and stress out over this choice. There is no perfect combination. But maybe you're playing on both sides of the fence. 
And then we have our health savings account. And this one I call the unicorn. There's only one account the IRS can never touch. And that's a health savings account. So within a health savings account, we're trying to set aside funds to cover that big cost that we're going to see in retirement. When I put money in, it's before taxes are taken out. As it's growing, it's not taxable. If I use it for health care in retirement, its intended purpose, none of it's taxed. You can't say that about any other account out there. So what do they do? They punish us. They say you can't put as much in this type of an account because it's the only one the IRS can't get their, their hands on. So it's lower amounts. Keep in mind with these contribution rates, this is between you and your employer. So it's an aggregate amount. But you can see if I'm covering just myself, 3,600, covering a family, now we're doubling that. And the catch up is over the age of 55. That throws some folks off. I could throw another thousand in there. And that can grow quite nicely. One point I'll make with the health savings account, the way my wife and I approach it is when we get a bill, if it's under X amount, we're going to pay cash and we're going to let our health savings account grow. I can hang on to that receipt and I can reimburse myself tomorrow or 10 years from now or 25 years from now in retirement. There's no time limitations on that. So it's almost like creating another emergency fund. But you decide what that number is if you're utilizing this type of feature. Another thing that we do is I'm paid every other week. My wife is paid every other week and we're on opposite weeks. Well, guess what? Four times out of the year, one of us is getting an additional paycheck. A third of the year, we have an additional paycheck. We only budget each month that we're getting two apiece. Well, every bill that comes in that month in healthcare, we're going to be paying cash for it. So there are ways to get creative with this, but I want to put a dent in that 300,000 because guess what? It's not going to be 300,000 20 years from now, 25 years from now. It's actually increasing about twice the rate of inflation. So we need to earmark funds for that. I'd rather be paying money out of an account that I knew this expense was coming instead of saying, well, I can't take that trip that I wanted to take. Or even worse, sorry, uh, Kalamazoo County, I'm not paying my taxes this year. I don't think that'll go over well either. So make sure we earmark for that health care cost and we add a little bit to it if we're further out from retirement. And if we're maximizing all of those, this is where the sky is the limit. The IRS cannot tell us how much to put in an investment account or a brokerage type account. So I could possibly still get tax deferred savings. It's only a tax liability when I sell an investment. I already mentioned that the IRS can't touch it. And with this type of an account, it's going off a different tax schedule. It's not those ordinary income rates. Now it's, hey, if I buy ABC company stock and a year goes by and I sell it, it's a long-term capital gain. Well, that may be less than ordinary gains. But if you're maximizing all three, and you still need that fourth account. You're saving really well and you're creating a good diverse income stream. So it's not only important to have diverse investments, we need diverse income as well. How is it going to be taxed? How can I manipulate which tax bracket I fall in? All right, remember in the beginning, I said I'm going to kind of switch the wording. And it's how can I grow my savings? And then once I'm in retirement, preserve, pay myself an in income. And it really boils down to the most important decision that you make. So it's, and this is based on research, based on science. More than 90% of an investor's success 
comes from one choice and one choice alone, which kind of devalues what I do for a living. But the most important choice that you make is when you're looking at this pie chart here, is what am I putting into stocks? What am I putting into bonds? And what am I putting into, we'll just call it cash or CDs or money markets or savings accounts. Notice on this screen, it says nothing about ABC company stock or XYZ mutual fund. The most important choice you make is the pie chart. How much am I putting into stocks and how much am I putting into bonds and other conservative type investments? But so many individuals overwhelm themselves and say, Alan, there are so many choices and they're giving themselves gray hair and ulcers. And I'll say, let's take a step back. What are some good rules of thumb? Well, if I'm 13, 15 plus years from retirement, I can take on more risk. The longest it's ever taken to rebound from any market correction, any, go back almost 100 years, is three years. So if I'm not within three years of retirement, market downturns are a good thing. We have a coupon on our retirement goals. I don't know how many times I said over the course of my career, if you are running towards the stock market when everybody else is running away, you're going to do really well. But these are good rules of thumb. If I'm within 13, 15 years of retirement, I can have 85% or more of my money in the stock market. And I know I can ride out the waves because I'm not going to touch it for a decade and a half or more. But once we get closer, we need to start reducing that risk. If I'm within 9, 10, 12 years of retirement, notice how that stock exposure went down quite a bit and that little gray bar snuck in. Maybe it's money market, maybe it's CD, maybe it's boring savings accounts. But the point is, we don't have all 100% of our hard earned savings exposed to something that is volatile. So we sidelined a little bit of it. When I get within, call it five years, let's go in the middle. We need to reduce it quite a bit more. And then once I reach retirement, this is known as balanced. I only have half exposed to the market. And I have half exposed to something that's maybe steady eddy, getting me some return, not seeing the the yo-yo of the of the stock market that we've seen. And this is how we typically remain over the course of our retirement. That gives us the growth that we need to make sure we're outpacing inflation, but still giving ourselves the ability to pay a pretty decent paycheck because now we're creating our own, but notice this progression from left to right. The wealthiest client that I've ever worked with, when he went through the recession, he lost north of $3 million in four months. Didn't bat an eye. He wasn't aggressive. He was extremely aggressive, 100% exposed to the market. Well, guess what? He went through the oil embargoes in the 70s. Didn't bother him. Hyperinflation in the 80s, the correction that we saw in the mid 90s, the tech bubble, if you remember Y2K and the sky was falling then, the recession did scare him. But we can't say that for everyone. How much am I comfortable with? When I start to see that fluctuation, am I going to pack my bags and run or am I going to increase my contribution because I know the, the market's on sale? So it's not only time, it's personal preference as well. So we're not saying buy and forget, but it's definitely put yourself at risk to the amount that you're going to stay the course in. Because when we're timing the market, more often than not, we're hurting ourselves instead of helping ourselves. So it boils down to two types of people. You have folks on the left, about 10% of the population. Alan, I don't need dorks like you. I can do this on my own. I got it. But hey, can you take a look at what I'm doing and, and, and see if if you do anything different, 
if everybody was an expert on this, I wouldn't have a career. But some folks are comfortable doing a little bit of research, picking their own funds, managing everything on their own. Other folks need help. And that's OK. You'll always have a, a, at least one option, and especially in your 401ks where you'll see ABC target and then it gives you a year, 2030, 2040. Well, you put 100 individuals in a room, 80 of them are using that type of an approach. It's a target date or a target year. Hey, Alan, I'm going to retire in 20 years. Well, you hands on or you hands off. I want nothing to do with it. OK, well, maybe you use the 2040 fund because that's about 20 years away. And guess what it does? It walks you through that progression. It's on autopilot. As I get closer to retirement, I should take on less and less risk. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I have a full time job. I go home, I have a family I have to take care of. You do what you do, I'll do what I do, and you're still in good shape. But what I challenge folks is know what you're comfortable with. Know what your recipe is. How much can I stomach if I go into the fall of 08 with $100,000 in my account and then the spring of 09 I only have 60,000? Those are pretty valid numbers, about a 40 or a 50% loss in a matter of months. What's your next step? So any advisor can say, hey, I think you should be aggressive. But do they know how you are going to react when we start seeing that fluctuation? A high percentage of the time, investors are not getting the returns that they are assuming they should get or that they were promised is because when they see a downfall, they sit on the sidelines. And then when they get more confidence, they go back into the market because it starts doing well. well. What did they do? They missed their chance to recoup the losses that they just saw. Go back to the recession. Fall of 08, I have $100,000. Spring of 09, I only have 60000 If I hold on to the fall of 2010, I'm back, on, back up to 100000 The sky was not falling. But if I fast forward, to the fall of 2013, not only am I recouping the 40,000 losses that I had, but now I'm up to 145, 150. It's like it never happened. That's the five year rule. If I stay the course, I re can recoup my losses and I can get back up to a decent average between six and 8%. And there's been 27 times that that rule has been tested and all 27 times it works. So market fluctuation, if you look at it properly, is a good thing. Unless I'm retiring in three to five years, then I need to make sure I'm on the far right of the screen. All right. So you make that choice. Am I hands on or am I hands off? Nothing wrong with either side of this screen. But once a year, still have that conversation with your advisor and and uh, make sure you're taking on the appropriate amount of risk. So let's do a quick recap, then we're gonna get into a formal Q&A. Everybody needs a million dollars. You need to replace 75% of your income. You need to have 10 times your household income saved by the time you reach your mid to late 60s. Crinkle them all up, throw them away. Walk through your budget now. What's in my expenses or what are my expenses that are here and now that are no longer going to be there when I'm in retirement. On top of that, make sure you factor in those risks, health care, longevity, inflation, withdrawal rates, market risk. That's where someone like myself comes in. We can do all that nerd work on our end and make sure that you're on track and you don't outlive your savings. If you're playing that game of catch up, you're maximizing what your employer is willing to give you. You're going out and maybe you're utilizing IRAs or house savings accounts or the other types of accounts. And if you know your number, if I'm doing X percent, I can retire when I want then you're in great shape and it will help you stay on track because we know the market is not going to have a positive return every month, every quarter, 
every year, but think of the stock market as a yo-yo, but you're standing on an escalator. Still that continued growth for its entire existence. And when it goes down, it's on sale. Warren Buffett said, you should be greedy when others are fearful. Buy low, sell high. You should be fearful when others are greedy. Sell high, buy low. It's what we've been taught our entire careers. So he has a little bit more money than we do, but still good, good mantra to have. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen here. So some folks say, Alan, I heard everything that you said, but uh, you're just going to do all this work for me because I have my breakfast to get to. So you do it while I'm sipping my coffee. You can have complimentary meetings. I'll send a link. If folks are looking for me to do some of that nerd work, I can be a resource. So make sure you put me to work. But for the folks that joined in the chat, what questions do we have? What can I help with? And I'll pause and see what is on everyone's minds. All right, now I'll address one elephant in the room. I talked a little bit about Social Security. And some younger professionals are saying, Alan, I'm not even planning on it. I don't think it's going to be there. And I was doing a workshop, uh, well, an in-person meeting before we got into the crazy last 18 months or so that we've been in. And I was standing on Ford Field, 3,000 people in the stands. And one guest said, Alan, should I plan for Social Security to be there? And I told every single person listening this, you can write down my name, the date, and the time. And if I'm wrong, I'll pay your benefit. But Social Security is going to be there. Yes, the fund's going to run out. They just did another report, early 2030s, mid 2030s. But what they're not sharing you is with payroll taxes alone, they're going to be covering about 75 or 80 percent of the liabilities for the next century almost. So Social Security will be there. It's just going to have to change forms. So that one comes up quite a bit, so I figured I'd address that. All right, I'll throw a question out there for everyone. So this is the first of, of many. It's, it's a direction that we're heading in to make sure that folks are getting the, the education that they need financially to, to make informed decisions. But it's not the only topic that I have up my sleeve here. So quick survey. There are a couple other topics that we could do next. Let me see where you folks are. First one. How do I maximize my Social Security? What are some strategies? When should I draw? How do some of those calculations affect my income over the course of my retirement? Second, well, you threw that figure out there of how much I may spend in healthcare, but help me understand what's all tied into that. And talk to me about this Medicare alphabet soup, A, B, D, F, what are all these letters for? And then you have income planning. Alan, you say we can take four to five percent out, but where's it coming from? If the market's down, then where should I take my money from? Or if it's up or if it's flat, you have to get creative on where it's coming from. And then there's investing 101. You know what? I would be comfortable doing all these things on my own if I just had a little bit more information, then I'd be dangerous. So of those four, Social Security, Healthcare, Investing 101, and uh, Income Planning, one, two, three, or four, what would be your top one if I, or maybe the, your top two? Let me see where the group is. All right, Healthcare and Investing 101, any of them except Investing. I love it, thank you for your honesty. Maximizing Social Security. So we have one, we have two, we have four. It looks like all of them so far besides. Perfect. All right, so I'll take note of that. I appreciate your input there. One minute left till the bottom of the hour here. Any other questions before we part ways? Let me know in the chat.
I don't see anyone typing, so I will say this. We are at the bottom of the hour. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate you joining. And well, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining. And I hope to see you all on our future workshops that we're going to be putting together. So I will let you get back to your evening. Take care, everyone.